really, I, it just kind of came down to the fact that like, you can make $10,000 renting houses, you can make $10,000 helping other people rent houses. And in one of those scenarios, the person that you are working with appreciates you. And in the other, they're going to rip the wiring out of your house and destroy it. I like, I like working with the people who appreciate you. <laughs> Hey, Rent to Retires, it's Adam Schrader here with another episode, joined as usual by Zach Lemaster, the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement. And we are joined today by the military millionaire himself, David. <laughs> it is an absolute pleasure to get to, to speak with you today. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Yourself? Uh, we're uh, doing well, chugging along. We wanted to bring you on because you have a great story um, to tell about your journey, and now you're you know, going out there and helping, you know, people all across the country, you know, make sure that they utilize uh, their benefits to invest in real estate. So tell us a little bit of your backstory, kind of what were you doing before you got into real estate? And now um, what are you focusing on in your investing journey? <laughs> what was I doing before I got into real estate? Well, so I, <laughs> I joined the Marine Corps in 2008 because I graduated from high school and I, or I was going to graduate from high school and I realized I didn't have money for school. I didn't have scholarships because I screwed around in high school and I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't like school anyway. And I didn't have any sports scholarships because I, uh, the one sport that I was maybe decent enough to have gotten one, I didn't play senior year because I was like, screw it. Rugby sounds fun. Let's do this instead. It's um, a great sport. It, it is, but I wasn't good enough at that playing only my senior year. Uh, so I threw baseball out senior year to go play rugby and, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I didn't set myself up very well. I didn't want to go to school, didn't have money for it, and I didn't want to stay in Arkansas. And so the Marine Corps seems like a really good way to travel, uh, go on some adventures. And that's kind of what I did. And it worked out great. And so what did I do before getting into real estate? I did what almost every Marine and most service members do. And that is I blew money on tattoos, alcohol, travel, women, and cars. Harley. Whatever, you know, if it's fast, fun, or probably a stupid purchase, I was there. Um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so then how did you get into your first deal then? You know, if you were blowing all your money on that, what made you decide, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna throw some money into this thing with four walls and a roof because that's, a, that's an actually, you know, semi-intelligent or intelligent uh, decision to make. Yeah, I'd love to claim the credit for that. Someone was trying to get me into Amway while I was a recruiter on, uh, in Missouri. And, you know, he told me to read rich dad, poor dad handed me the book. And I was like, dude, I don't read. And <laughs> I kid you not. He pulled a CD out of his pocket and was like, yeah, but you drive all the time to high schools and you're chaperoning kids around and just listen to it while you're driving around. And I was like, Ugh, got me. All right, fine. <laughs> like I'll, I'll listen to your stupid book. Cause like, he called my bluff, right? And uh, thank God he did that because I listened to the dumb book and now I've listened to the dumb book like four times, you know, and it changed my life, right? So I read that book and then I got sucked into Audible and I read another book and another book and another book and another book and then I found uh, Bigger Pockets because I would be like, I don't know what that word is. Let me Google it and Bigger Pockets would pop up. I found all the Bigger Pockets books and it might have been three months, maybe four before between reading that first book and buying a duplex and it was just kind of a stroke of luck how everything played out there was uh my lease on my 2-1 apartment was 550 a month that it was coming due in december you know january december whatever and i was able to find a duplex for like 79.9 where the mortgage was gonna be like i don't remember the exact numbers but in the high five low low six you know um Actually, sorry, the mortgage was less than that, but my all-in cost was like five seventy-five or something like that, and one tenant was paying like four twenty-five, and so I moved in, and uh, I didn't have any money for down payment because I had a zero or negative net worth, might have been balanced out by a <laughs> little bit of money I'd put in a four hundred one k, but I happened to, again, all just dumb stroke of luck timing, I was in a bar eating a cheeseburger having a beer and some dude was hammered and he was parked next to my Harley and just cranked the wheel to the left and floored it out of the 
uh, parking lot and ran over my Harley. And he came in and was like, you know, who owns this bike? I'm like, that's me. He's like, uh, you need to come outside. You used to own a Harley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he totaled it, right? But he owned a car dealership. And so he couldn't afford to take the insurance hit. And so he cut me a check for the value of the Harley. Uh, the next day, I went by his dealership, cut me a check for the value of the Harley. And then I took the remains of the Harley, which was not in as bad a shape as you'd think, to the dealership. And they gave me like another two, three grand for what was left of it. And so I made basically what would have been like the original purchase price of the Harley back after putting 11,000 miles on it over three or four years. Uh, and that ended up being, you know, the down payment and LVP and whatever on this FHA loan for the duplex, uh, with like 2,500 in cash reserves. And so it was like just perfect timing, all of that. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened. That doesn't well, seem like a smart move by an Amway person to give rich dad, poor dad to someone. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you, you know, Kiyosaki actually, um, he talks about in some of his books, like the most important skill you can have is to sell. So he and he actually um, references some some of these uh, what do they call them MLM right oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, sources as as a good way to actually maybe even like just learn how to sell I think that is potentially applicable but but obviously it sparked your interest David for for real estate right and just how to think about money and and fortunately for you there is an audio version and there are some pictures in the book that <laughs> that even a marine can understand so it talks about toothpaste yeah That's yeah. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is something, I mean, we see whether it's the military or, or otherwise, um, most certainly in the military, we see this a lot, right? Where we have um, some, some young kids coming in and they get their first paycheck. And this is potentially their first time earning like money, right? A, or a, a salary. And it, it goes out the door as soon as it comes in. Uh, we want to hear more about your real estate investing journey that, and this is crazy how you just kind of fell into this this uh, scenario to be able to purchase this duplex. Um, and I, you know, that it's a little nuts that you trusted this guy on his, on his check, but uh, it worked out, right? It worked out. But one of your, let's talk about your community real quick. you you built, you know, the millionaire, uh, the military millionaire community. You guys have uh, like over 50,000 people following on Facebook and like you're active out there putting a lot of, of education. Tell us about your mission and kind of the why of, of contributing to this. I mean, is it the fact that you you have the sense of community with the military and you see a lot of young kids like you coming in and blowing money and not making appropriate steps? Or tell us about that journey as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because that was never started with any intention of becoming what it is, right? And five years ago when that started, the, the genuine reason for it, I was sitting at dinner. Brandon Turner was over at my house in Oahu. He was looking for a house out there and – you know, we had access to, I lived on Marine Corps base Hawaii. So it was like, Hey man, you want to come check out the base? Everybody wants to surf on, you know, base housing or whatever base beach. So like, come check out the base. We got a cool view. Um, had him over. Man, for dinner. I, I feel like you skipped the step. How, how did you meet? How did you know Brandon oh, Turner? It's, it's the beard uh, community. It's less <laughs> underground beard. Well, I didn't have a beard back then. I was a, you know, <laughs> a sergeant, maybe a staff sergeant by then, but um, I was a, I had a mustache. No, I didn't even, yeah, no, I might've had a mustache by then, but I was clean shaven. Um, uh, I had, yeah, it kind of another stroke of luck, right? I went to a local networking meetup on, he posted one day that he was going to be on the Island. And so I went to this meetup. I didn't want a fangirl. So I said, hi, real quick, you know, and then I ended up talking to this dude named Doug Nordman most of the time. Who's, I mean, I talked to some of the other locals, uh, cause I just figured it was better spent to hang out with the locals. Cause I figured I'd never really talk to or see Brandon again. And, Doug's this guy with a long ponytail, kind of balding up front and Loha shirts, Navy submarine dude, retired, who just teaches surfing on the side for free. Uh, hasn't worked in now probably 20, 25 years uh, since he got out of the Navy. And I little did I know that Doug was the reason Brandon was on the island. So Doug invites me to go surfing on Saturday and he'll help me out. I've still somewhat new to the island and learning to surf. And I'm like, oh, sweet. I haven't been over that, that side of the island I'd love to come surf and I show up and I'm on a surfboard with, you know, sitting next to Brandon and Doug for four hours. And so my not fangirling over Brandon turned into hanging out with Brandon the next weekend. Then the next day at lunch with Brandon and David green, 
who had come out to the island and I met him. So I met, this is why I'm tied in so tight with bigger pockets. Like I met David green before he wrote his first book. I met Scott trench before he wrote his first book. I read, like I met all these people while they were all out hanging out with Brandon, just through the fact that I had chosen to hang out with Doug and didn't have any idea that that's who anyway. So then Brandon's looking for this house and he comes back out the second time. And I'd just kind of been sending him, I'd been doing driving for dollars. And so I'd been sending him potential live-in flips. Um, none of them worked out, obviously, because he chose a different island to live on. Uh, but just not asking for anything, right? Just sending him things that might be a value add. And so we, you know, he was over for dinner. And at one point before they left the island that time, he actually parked his car in my garage for like four months. And then I shipped it to Maui when they moved to Maui. Um, Cause they bought a car while they were in the island. You charged him rent, right? Dude? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that, that man has made me enough uh, connections and, and, uh, and, and as you'll see in this dinner conversation, enough money um, that it, it, the car was more than paid for. Uh, so we, we're having dinner. And so I, when I was in Afghanistan in 2010, I kept a journal and a mission log and I always thought it'd be cool. And, and one of these like, days I'll get around to like combining them to where it's like, you know, Hey, on this day, this mission happened. And here's how I was feeling about that, you know, and just like a book about what normal people went through in Afghanistan instead of the guy who shot bin Laden or, uh, you know, all these crazy seals and berets who, don't talk, don't talk about their ops because they're secret. Um, you know, like this is what a normal dude who drives trucks went through like that kind of story. Uh, and so I asked Brandon, like, dude, I failed an English class in high school. How the hell do I learn to write? You know, what do I, what do I do? And he's like, start a blog. Okay, cool. What should I blog about? He's like, nobody's really talking about real estate as a military dude. Just document what you're doing. And that's literally that conversation that week. I was like Googling, how do I start a blog? How do I start a Facebook group? And there was no, no vision, no intention for anything. I mean, my first few articles are like how to search Google with advanced search terms. <laughs> you know, this is me learning how to effectively utilize Google. This is me learning what the VA loan is. This is, you know, and then over time it became, people found the website and they'd be like asking questions. And so then I would answer the questions and then the content slowly morphed. And, and then all of a sudden one day it was like, I woke up and things just went bonkers. Uh, like I remember the day in 2020 where it was like a light switch. The Facebook group went from like a hundred new members a week to like 300 a day. And I was just like, Oh God, what's going on? Like, I can't even, I, I need a VA to just accept people into the Facebook group. This is nuts. And then, it, you know, then it became like, we're onto something I have a, so yeah, the mission became, uh, you know, just help service members and vets learn how to build wealth, right. Learn how to use their benefits. The VA loan, uh, became something that I was much more intentional about, much more passionate about when I realized how much I could, you know, inflect change and leave a legacy. And, and really I, it just kind of came down to the fact that like you can make $10,000 renting houses can make $10,000 helping other people rent houses. And in one of those scenarios, the person that you are working with appreciates you. And in the other, they're going to rip the wiring out of your house and destroy it. But I like, I like working with the people who appreciate you. <laughs> so it's so you've got a, I mean, and um, it's just crazy how this has exploded, but that's, you, you went into it with the idea of just adding value, right. And just being as a resource, this wasn't, you're not in selling something. You're you're out there to educate and document what you're doing uh, yep. to improve yourself too, but also just as a resource. And that's I think that's that's great with the you know that you get that natural organic traction um, when when you're out there operating like that. So um, you have the Facebook group, and that's for, and your uh, for, overnight success. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We started yesterday. What else, what else is going on with the military millionaire? I mean, I want to get back to hearing about your personal story and kind of what you are doing on the real estate side specifically. But I mean, since we're on, you know, the, the business side, tell us a little bit more about what you guys are doing. Um, you have the, this great community where people can collaborate and share ideas and things like this, but do you have opportunities for them? Do you have coaching mastermind? Like what, what else are you doing? You have your book, you know, let's talk about that. So. Yeah. So, you know, we've got, I've got, I've got the book, the no BS guide to military life. Basically everything I wish I'd known when I joined, uh, just 
a couple months ago, we launched a 90 day planner, military millionaire planner, uh, physical copy. We've got a digital version, basically 90, 95% of what I do is just free stuff on Facebook, YouTube podcast, whatever. Cause it, I, I believe in value first, you know, and then it's things like this where I got fed up with using different journals and thinking they all missed something. So I made my own. And then one of my buddies was like, dude, that's sick. I want one. And then another buddy said the same thing. And then another buddy and then another buddy. And I was like, Shit, I should probably just go ahead and publish this thing. <laughs> Cause I was like flipping through printed pages of paper, using it as my own journal in like Columbia. And one of my buddies is like, dude, that looks really cool. What's that? I'm like, Oh, it's the planner I kind of made for myself. He's like, I'd use that. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> and like that's kind of how it came to be. I was never going to sell the thing. Um, and it's doing well. So, uh, you know, and then, yeah, we, the, the, I guess crown jewel, I mean, there's a few small courses, but the crown jewel is the, the war room, which is our mastermind group. So there's 205 members right now. It's priced low enough that every mentor I've ever had comes in and says, you're an idiot, raise the price. Um, so it's super, super, super valuable. No one's ever asked for their money back on the 30 day guarantee, which I love. And, uh, the community's, awesome so it's just that's the only part of the community that is actually strictly service members and vets you got to either be active reserve or have a dd214 don't even allow spouses in and uh it's uh it, it's crazy because i mean i'm not the big fish in that group there's some guys running you know seven eight figure businesses and a uh, thousand units and just crushing it and it's a community full of Really, it's just an accountability networking community, and it's just full of people who are willing to add value to each other because they all see that everyone's got a little skin in the game. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. So when it comes to your first purchase um, and using those military benefits, why, and it, based on what you write now, did you not know about the VA loan at the time? Could you, Were you not eligible for it? I was wondering that too. Why FHA? If no, yeah. No. Uh you know, it's funny. Ugh, I don't tell many people this. I have not ever used the VA loan. <laughs> and I have helped people in the community buy over a hundred, probably at $120 million worth of properties with the VA loan in the last three years um, through just direct introductions, let alone God knows what I've done indirectly. Um, so with the first one, it's because the lender did the thing that is – like the most common misconception with the VA loan. And he sat me down and said, you can only use this once. Don't waste it on an $80,000 duplex. You're an idiot. And I was like, Oh, that makes sense. So I didn't do it. He was wrong. Obviously you can use the VA loan a bajillion times. There's no limit to how many times you can use it. It just boils out to how much entitlement you have left. And I know someone who's had four VA loans out at the exact same time on duplexes. Um, a $79,000 duplex would not have stopped me from buying a house in any market zero down. So yeah, he had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, and then when we moved to Hawaii, this, the limit still existed on first time use and it was just way too low. We made like five offers and got outbid on everything because I didn't have enough capital for the additional down payment. And then uh, when I moved uh, to Missouri, I was just in that weird situation where I was unbankable because all of my LLCs are real estate. So they show a loss and I had just exited the military. So I had no W2 and I hadn't gotten disability yet. So I had to do a 5% down conventional and gift my wife the down payment to qualify for this property. Um, so I've just always been in like this really weird bracket, which is funny, but also means that I have full entitlement for when I decide screw it, I'm moving to Maui and want to buy a $3 million triplex and go zero down and there's no limit and I will be able to do that. So did they get rid of the limit? Or is that, I mean, it's geographically yeah. dependent, right? So for your first use, there's no limit anymore. Hmm. Uh, after that, yeah, the county limit still, still kicks in and all those normal rules apply. But first time use uh, as of January 1st of 2020, no. And what's crazy about that is that the VA loan still has no credit or DTI requirements. So if your lender is willing to play ball, there's some, I mean, I've seen a, 
I saw someone buy a $1.93 million duplex on Venice Beach, like literally on the water, uh, as an active duty captain selected for major uh, with like a 73% DTI. And now that property is up, you know, <laughs> 600, 650,000, I think, in equity and it's cash flowed the whole time he's lived in yeah, it. Yeah, let's go, let's go find you one of these uh, luxury <laughs> mountain uh, short term rentals, David. Well, you know, when you buy that, uh, that big triplex in Hawaii, you can thank the lender who gave you the terrible advice at the beginning because now you've got that. Uh, that yeah, that's, that's huge. Buy. I was, I was unaware. I've, I've used a VA loan a ton of times. I think right now I have three VA loans out and um, you know, I'm only living in one of them. Um, but I've had them for time, of course, but I didn't realize that that that's huge. You know, if there's no loan on your first time use, yeah, you, you might as well in that case go big if it's going to make sense and you can actually afford it, you know, don't, don't foreclose on it, lose it. <laughs> yeah. And, but, and technically if you were to sell out of all three of those, uh, or can, or refi out of them all or whatever, you can do a one-time restoration, pull all your entitlement back, and one time you can still have no limit. Uh, oh, so see, now the plot thickens. Now you're, yeah. you're really getting to me. Okay. Yeah, I think I saw and, a lot of wheels turning in Zach's head and, right there. And to make it even crazier, so that 1.93 was nuts, I got a phone call. I won't name the guy because I don't want to – I don't know if he wants his name thrown out under the bus, but uh, somebody who is – has a massive social media following and is the right hand man to uh, uh, probably my favorite or second favorite podcaster in the world, and also has a massive you know we're talking millions of followers. Uh, got the guy has two Rolls Royces. Um, called me three months ago, and he's like, "Yo, uh, I just wanted to let you know in case I decide to shout it out online," which he didn't just probably because he doesn't want people to know what he just bought, uh, <laughs> but he's like. Uh, I was about to buy a house, you know, me and my wife were under contract. We moved from this town to this town and we we're under contract on a house. We were about to put 20% down, but on a whim, I decided to just see what you had on your website about the VA loan. And I didn't realize that there was no limit first time use. So I wanted to thank you for saving me a 20% down payment. And I was like, oh yeah, man, that's awesome. And he's like, yeah, uh, it's a two and a half million dollar house. So you saved me a half a million dollar down payment. I was like, oh. <laughs> no, that, that's cool. <laughs> Adam's Adam's ready to enlist right now just for the VA loan. I was like, geez, man, that's <laughs> super cool. Like, I mean, obviously this guy's super well off at an anomaly, but I'm like, that's, cr I mean, when you think about like opportunity costs, like that's crazy. I, I, uh, that's huge. I mean, being, being creative, there's, there's no mortgage insurance with the VA either. So, I mean, put 0% down, you usually get a lower rate. If you yeah. do have any sort of disability often, uh, and I forget the exact percentage, you probably know David, but you, you have your, uh, your funding fee, uh, re removed, right? Is that 50% or something? I don't know. But uh, 10%, or, 10 or, or, uh, and they actually, uh, changed it now. If you're still active duty and don't have a disability, but you're a purple heart recipient, you can also, it's also waived. And that's, that's huge, right? That yep. could be, that's tens of thousands of dollars in some case. Um, so it's just a, a great loan. So you've, um, you know, you got that real estate bug, you got rid of your Harley and, uh, and got into real estate, read Kiyosaki, which by the way, um, David has had uh, some huge names on your podcast, which is just outstanding. Grant Cardone, Kiyosaki himself. I mean, that's a exactly. total master. <laughs> I don't know about American. that guy, but uh, what I mean, just out of a personal curiosity, how, how do you schedule with those people? How do you get those? I feel like if I wouldn't even know how to even begin to reach out to like Kiyosaki. Some of it's dumb luck. And a lot of it is networking. Seems like you have a lot of those stories. So <laughs> that's, I mean, that's my networking style is either dumb luck or, or asking for warm intros. Um, so Grant Cardone was just pure dumb luck. He was trying to do a pitch uh, for a fund. He posted on Instagram that was like, yo, I want to do a bunch of podcasts and here's an email. And it was like, I saw the email. It was, I mean, it, his story, that story might've been up for three hours and I saw it and it was like, I shot him an, an email and then I copied my message. <laughs> I sent it to my co-host and I sent it to like 10 friends. And I was like, everybody send this email, this message and direct it back to my email. And we are going to make sure that we get heard. Uh, and here's the crazy thing about that. So that happened. And I guess I'll give the other part of this story because this will be even funnier when it comes out. So, the Robert Kiyosaki 
<laughs> I'm drinking at Bigger Pockets conference, and while drinking, I'm not going to name the guy, but the old Bigger Pockets uh, producer is a friend, a personal friend, and apparently I was slightly intoxicated, which is why I say apparently it was you know slightly, <laughs> which is why I don't even remember this happening. Um, and I'm ribbing him like, dude, you guys had this guy on the podcast. He's a Marine. I'm a Marine. I don't know why I haven't had him on the podcast yet. I'm holding you again. Like that's, that's on you for not making the introduction. Like what the heck, you know, don't remember the conversation. Like it was, I don't know, midnight, had a couple beers. It was just giving him a hard time, right? Not whatever. So like we get back from bigger pockets and like two days later, I get an introduction from this guy directly to me, to Robert's assistant. And it's this, really nice like three paragraph really really well thought out warm introduction and i texted him like dude that was awesome but like thanks for thinking of me like what where'd that come from he's like <laughs> you don't even remember talking about it I'm you like, threatened me too. Yeah, he's <laughs> like you were giving me such a hard time about how you're a marine and i didn't make an intro so the funny thing though is when you get guests that size they basically tell you like this date this time take it or leave it right and uh or they'll give you like two or three options and so Grant gives me a date and a time and it's like 1 p.m. You've got 25 minutes on this Wednesday. And I'm like, cool. And then I kid you not, like two hours later, I get an email and Robert's team is like 1.45 p.m. Same day, take it or leave it. And I'm like, oh, God. So I, and my co-host is out of the country in uh, Tulum that week. <laughs> and I'm like, Alex. Uh, either you're going to miss the two biggest guests we've ever had on the show, or you're going to figure it out. Sorry. Uh, cause I, I'm not saying no and I'm not rescheduling. And so Alex is like, if you watch the episodes, he's like sitting at a coffee shop in Tulum, uh, trying to do this podcast while he's on vacation in another country because they both scheduled within like the same hour out of, I was like, what the heck are the odds of this? It's pretty funny. Interesting. Well, now uh, we're going to have to have uh, some drinks and put some pressure on you to uh, make an introduction. <laughs> yep. And this isn't dumb luck, though. This is this is you like taking an opportunity, right? Or, or making an opportunity. Yeah. You could have just reached out to Grant, but you you had multiple people do this for you, right? Like you were ensuring that you had the highest chance of success. Um, you know, and I think that's important to point out because there's a lot of things that you know people can say that they've done or you're doing, but I mean going that extra mile is really how you, you do accomplish things. So tell us a little bit more, just, I mean, let's, let's talk about your, your personal investing, David, you're out there, you got, you know, you're writing books and helping a ton of people and probably going to use your VA loan soon, but educating everyone on it. But like, what, what else are you doing in real estate? What interests you? What excites you about the real estate realm with, you know, everything there is out there. And I've, I've, I'm the uh, epitome of the shiny object guy. So uh, or the, uh, what is the, the Jack of all trades, master of none. And then I'm the, I'm the only guy who remembers the back half of that, which is oftentimes better than a master of one. Cause I like to rub in people's face that they forget the real end of the quote and go, you're missing part. You're missing part. Um, so man, I, I just, at this point, I just tell people that I'm just a buy and hold guy. And when people are like, Oh, cool. What do you buy and hold? I'm like, no, no that's the end of my sentence. Like <laughs> it, God, if it can be bought and held and it'll cash flow, then there you go. Um, and I mean, I've, I've wholesaled and I've flipped and I've bird and I've, you know, I had a wholesaling company. We were doing four deals a month at one point that we were, we'd like wholesale two and flip one and burr one. And, and I sold that thing last summer cause I just didn't enjoy it. You have to feed the beast so much on those businesses. Uh, and, I don't like flipping very much, but I've done it. I'm about to finish one right now. Um, you know, and there's all these things going on, but normally and traditionally, I just like buying things that I can hold on to that I don't have to do the ops on. Um, and a lot of what I bought at first was, you know, took a lot of time and effort because it was, I had to go high leverage, high, uh, you know, class D stuff because I didn't have a whole lot of capital. So I needed the best bang for buck. And now I'm kind of transitioning out of that into, bigger, more passive opportunities where I'm either partnering with someone who's the operator or looking into like developing or LP type stuff, uh, focusing on what my strengths are, like class A properties. But I mean, currently my portfolio involves, uh, when I 
this, this will make sense for why I just say buy and hold period, uh, a 40 unit hotel, a 23 unit apartment, a 15 unit apartment, uh, probably 21 to four unit properties that I own amongst a couple LLCs and a 28 pad RV park. We just fell out of contract on a 14 uh, pad mobile home park that had room to grow another 28 pads. And then looking at another mobile home park that uh, actually come to think of it, the guy was supposed to call me last night and he didn't. So I need to call him. Um, <laughs> That one's off market, so we'll see. Hopefully, some seller carry in there. Looking at self storage, uh, bought and sold another apartment at one point. Um, I've done a land deal where I bought a raw lot for you know eighty five hundred, and then seller financed it to someone for twenty k with nine percent interest. Um, just a bunch of random, you know, if it makes sense to hold on to it, I'll do it. You are buy and hold assets. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're you, you would be. Um, I don't want to say scattered, but diversified. So, um, but I mean, that's, that's really the, it, it, you've done a lot of stuff and a lot of different uh, asset classes and varieties, but I mean, everyone sometimes wants to focus on the, the sexy part of real estate, I guess. Of, yeah. At least in the beginning, it seems like flipping or the burr, or the, uh, you know, or like creative finance or something like this. But I mean, there are short-term rentals. I mean, the next, shiny object. But the reality is, yeah, just, just holding real estate over time. That's time is what allows real estate to grow wealth. Right. And just holding it over time and just continually to, you know, focusing on scaling your portfolio. So the, the only sexy thing about flipping is HGTV and the Instagram <laughs> before and after pictures. Yeah. There is nothing about <laughs> flipping. Anyone who's done flipping is either a sadist or lying about what they consider sexy about. I don't, <laughs> I've done a ton and I have not enjoyed like anything that's other than like a lipstick is just a miserable experience. Yeah. Really. Some, I tell people it's like sometimes you, uh, and this is where the turnkey route, it really makes sense for some people, but some people get really excited about real estate, right? And they want to be like an active investor, um, but they're making $150,000, $200,000 at their job or profession. And then, you know, they're spending twice as much time to flip a house that maybe has 20 or $40,000 of profit and takes them 18 months to complete sometimes loses money. You know, it's like, just, just spend the time on your job, <laughs> you know, just spend the time and spend the, the extra time with your family. But yeah. I digress. <laughs> I did a flip that was supposed to be six months and took 15 that I sold January 30th and the private lender made more on it than I did. <laughs> that that often happens sometimes, especially as you have extended, you know, time periods with those for sure. I always tell people I love the idea of knocking down walls. I do not like the idea of hanging back walls back up. Uh, so, so, yeah. yeah, Adam's got a few recent stories. He's uh, I know you had a little bit of an interest in Little Rock. He just uh, not that we have to go too too deep in his story, but he was able to get rid of a nightmare Little Rock property. So. A couple yeah, just last week, right, Adam? Properties in various markets, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, depending on what part of Little Rock you bought in, right? I mean, it. When people people tell me they drove through Little Rock, I'm like, before you tell me whether you like it or not, and before I ask you, let me just ask which exit you got off on. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the problem wasn't the house. It was just a bad tenant. You know, bad tenants happen. Unfortunately, this one was uh, was pretty bad. But you know. That <laughs> Yeah. Well, especially yeah. if you inherit them. Inherited tenants are have always been my worst. Like, not that I haven't had bad experiences with tenants that my property manager screened for sure, but all of my like legitimate nightmare stories have been tenants I inherited. It's part of the game sometimes. Yeah. So, how did you become? Uh, I mean, right now, like you look at your site, you are the guy to go to for VA information. How did you educate yourself? Like, what did? Was it just going to meetups and listening to people and reading books or how did you really drill down, especially, you know, doing all of these other investment types in real estate, but then, you know, educating on the VA, what, how did you educate yourself enough to feel like you could provide value to people? I read the guidelines for one. Um, that was a huge part of it was reading the guidelines, talking to a lot of lenders, asking a lot of lenders, uh, you know, knowing which lenders actually knew what they were doing. Uh, my roommate for a little while in San Diego for like a year, year and a half was a VA lender. Well, a lender, but did a lot of VA loans. So ran a lot of stuff by him, um, read the guidelines, but a lot of it was 
as the community grew, those were most like a lot of the most popular questions were around the VA loan. And I felt a obligation to, as the person built in the community and, and whatever to provide resources, provide answers. And the best way to do that was to go and research. Like if people are asking about the EARL, the interest rate reduction refinance loan, I need to do a ton of research on this thing so I can write a really legit article so that I can just drop the link and say, here's my thoughts or here's some information. Boom. Rather than try to like articulate it every time in a post, I can just be like, here you go. And it's 10 times more thought out and whatever. Um, and so that forced me to really learn, right? Like my article right now on the VA, like assuming the VA loan, uh, a lot of lenders have told me is better than most of the resources out there. And it's not because I'm some great writer. It's because I go and take like 15 different resources and just compile everything into dumbed down Marine speak because I'm like somebody like I want to share this in the Facebook group and be like, this will answer all of your questions because I had no idea how to do this. And this made it like I did four hours of research and here's everything. Um, and over time, I just got to a place where it was like repetition. I've answered these questions six million times and vets want to know this stuff. And man, the VA loan, you know, I, I, I just I get so fed up at hearing people say that it's not competitive or it's not that great or complaining about the funding fee because they don't actually know math Um and they don't understand that the funding fee is peanuts compared to PMI or MIP or opportunity cost. Or, uh, I mean, it's $11 per $100,000 you borrow. It's 11 bucks a month. You, a million dollar loan, you're paying $110 a month. Actually, it's going down 0.15% for first use and 0.3% for second use. So it's less than that hit April 3rd, I think it's going to be less than that. And I haven't run the numbers, but you know, it's, it's nothing compared to, I think the PMI on my $80,000 duplex was $81 a month. Yeah. It's, it's like when people talk about interest rates currently right now, and um, you know, as if it's uh, it's preventing them from investing or they're choosing not to simply because of property cash flows slightly less. Um, but they're forgetting all the big picture, all the other things that come along with owning real estate over time. Right. And it's, yeah, the opportunity cost is, is more important, but I get it. It's a, it's another number. You got to look at it, the interest rate and, and factor it in the, and calculate the cash flow and make, make it make well, sense. But, check, check this out with the VA loan. In case somebody listening to this isn't familiar with the Earl, the VA has the best hedge for interest rates because let's say you're really torn and you're like, Oh no, I'm thinking about buying. I mean, obviously I, I'm not an advocate for buying. If you're only going to live somewhere for like a year and you don't have any intention of moving back there and you don't want to own a rental there and whatever, like just rent a freaking house. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can even rent a place in sublet bedrooms. I did it in San Diego for 18 months, rented a place, four bed, three bath, subletted bedrooms hmm. on Airbnb, rented it for, I had it approved in the lease. But uh, $3,000 a month in rent, $2,700 was my average Airbnb income. So pretty much lived for free and I did fine, didn't use a loan. Um, but if you're going to buy and it makes sense, you're going to have it long term, right? Because long term, you're going to get, even if the market tanks, you hold that thing long enough, you'll be fine. The beauty with the VA loan when it comes to interest rates in a market like this, if you lock that rate in today and the rate goes up to 12%, well, you locked it in today, so you're good. But if you lock that rate in today and everybody's scared that it's going to drop to 4% and they miss out, well, 210 days later or six month, six monthly payments later, you can do the EARL, the Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan. And for the EARL, there's no credit check, there's no income verification, and you don't even need to live in the damn house anymore. So you can just snap your fingers, and as long as the rate's dropped enough that you save enough money to recoup your 0.5% funding fee on the Earl uh, within whatever timeline, uh, then you're good. And you can just lower your rate and refi. You don't, you can't pull cash out, but it's just a rate reduction and you don't even have to live in the house anymore. So if the rates drop in two years, use the Earl. Doesn't matter if you live there anymore. Doesn't matter if you're jobless. Doesn't matter if you have income. Doesn't matter if you have credit. Like you could have a zero credit score, no job and live in Taiwan and make a phone call refi the house, drop the rate. So, yep. Great hedge. 
Lots of lots of good nuggets on the VA loan. Um, and like I said, I think Adam's ready to turn in his papers. He might be over the age threshold, though. The Marines probably would still take him. I don't know. No, um, I got we're actually the strictest yeah. on age. Nobody would want me. The well, Army. National Guard will get will take you. Yeah, there, there you go. Um, yeah, David, I'm convinced you should probably just open up your own mortgage brokerage. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what is kind of in closing here, I mean, Give us a couple nuggets of knowledge or parting words, or maybe, you know, what advice would you have for someone <clears throat> that is in the early stages of their investing career? Maybe they're, you know, just recently they're young in the military, they've just recently enlisted or whatever the case is, but they're interested to just take smart financial decisions and start looking at real estate. We know you're going to hand them a copy of the CD audio book for Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but what, what else? And my advice is the same. This, I mean, this has been my advice now for like probably six months on podcasts. I think it's going to stay the same for a long time. And it is to filter and learn to filter the advice that you receive through the lens of has the person giving me this advice achieved the success that I want in the area that they're giving me advice in? Do they live the life that I want to live? in that area. And so the perfect example of this that I, the analogy that I give is let's say you want to be a UFC fighter and I'm not a big UFC follower, but we'll use that example because it makes sense. The odds are that your mom is, she, she probably loves you and she probably has your best interest at heart. And if not, you can just pretend for the case for this scenario. Um, but she probably is not a professional UFC coach. And so you probably aren't going to hire your mom to coach you on UFC. You're going to go hire Ray Longo for striking or a Gracie brothers for jujitsu or whatever. And so that's just the way it is, right? Your mom loves you and she has your best interest at heart, but that's not who you're going to trust to get you into the octagon for the UFC, right? Because no matter how much she loves you and has your best interest at heart, she doesn't know what she needs to know to coach you in that arena. And yet for some damn reason, when you jump into real estate, the same person giving you that advice who's never owned a house or never owned an investment starts trying to talk you out of it because of X, Y, Z and you listen to them rather than listening to the person who owns a thousand rental properties or has a hundred million dollar net worth or a yacht or whatever, because the person who's got a $10 million net worth and owns 25 apartment complexes or a jet or whatever the thing is that you're trying to achieve is not the person who's going to talk you out of being ambitious and achieving your goals. They might tell you to be a little cautious or avoid this or avoid that, but they're not going to try to talk you out of achieving your dreams. The people who haven't achieved it and have no idea what they're talking about or don't know or understand that arena will, you know, but like the professional UFC coach isn't going to talk you out of getting punched in the mouth. Your mom might. Yeah. Your mom's going <laughs> to. Yeah. So filter the advice. Have they achieved what they need to in this arena? to be giving me that advice. If not, take it with a grain of salt and move on. Get in the room with people who have achieved what you want to and pay attention to them. I love it. Great advice. Fantastic. Well, David, the website is from military to millionaire.com. I know you mentioned that you've got a, a book and the um, journal and all that. Tell people where they can find all of that. So if they go to the best podcast guest.com, they can get a free copy of the book, The No BS Guide to Military Life. Uh, it's a PDF. So if you're in the military, you should get it. And if you're not, you should download it anyway and give it to someone who's in the military. And it's also got all my socials and everything. So that's the best way to get connected to me. For a long time, I told people to just reach out on Instagram and no one ever did. So now it's one spot. You can find all my social media. So thebestpodcastguest.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it for everybody who wants to actually start acquiring these assets. You know, we've got properties over at renttoretirement.com. That's at renttoretirement.com. Don't forget, if you would like a copy of Zach's latest report, the one about the top 20 markets to invest in in 2023, you can find that by emailing podcasts at renttoretirement.com and asking for it. We'll get it sent over to you as soon as possible. Also, if you leave a review on whatever podcast platform you use, take a screenshot and send it to that same email address, podcast at rentretirement.com. We'll get you a $10 thank you gift card and enter you into a $500 closing cost 
raffle that we are doing at the end of June 2023. Really appreciate the time you spent educating yourself today, and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.